T-Bone is on the other side. T-Bone is on the other side. T-Bone Brackets Podcast on the other side. T-Bone Brackets Podcast on the other side. T-Bone, he said to talk, originates, opinionates. T-Bone, musicality, originality. Any day of the week, Brackets Podcast on the other side. T-Bone Brackets. The talk space where musicians matter. Welcome to T-Bone's Prime Cuts on the Other Side, Episode 4. Today's guest, guitarist and producer Danny Mangold. We'll talk about his former band, The Metros, their time on Star Search. We'll talk about his moving to Seattle, Washington, meeting Mark Cardenas of the time, and Charles Neville, the Neville Brothers, and forming the band The Songcatchers, opening a vintage guitar store, Danny's Music, in the early 90s. Talk about the celebrity clients he had, and how it became the place for the Seattle bands of the early 90s and through the 90s, and a great Dave Grohl story. Talk about him forming a band with Chris Barron of the Spin Doctors, working with Ann Wilson from Heart, his terrible car accident, his recovery, his solo CDs, one of which made my top favorite albums of 2020, and then his new CD with former Metro singer Jody Hanks. We'll even throw in a little bit about the Jimi Hendrix Memorial Gravesite, all on T-Bone's Prime Cuts on the other side. Without further ado, here's Danny Mangold. Well, welcome to T-Bone's Prime Cuts on the other side. Our guest today is Danny Mangold. Danny, how are you? I am awesome, Terry. It's so good to see you. You too. Now, I know that a lot that we have a lot of the same influences and guitarists and artists. Who were some of the, you know, when you started playing, who were some of the guys that made you go, oh yeah, I want to play guitar? It was um, it was the local guys, believe it or not, that were influenced by you know, from my age group, you know, everybody is February 9th, 1964, the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't go see the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. So it was the local bands that were influenced by that British invasion. And I was at that time, I was living in a, t a town in Montana that had an air base and air base guys were from all over. And so there was a, uh, a big group of bands that were playing a lot of soul music, R&B and blues, they weren't from Montana, they were from all over. So we'd go see those bands. And that was the biggest thing was, I've seen the Beatles and the Stones and the Yardbirds, now I'm seeing a local band and they're doing it and that electric sound uh, reverberating in a high school gym or there used to be gigs, believe it or not, at the, uh, at the, uh, the Catholic Church, it was like a CYO, oh, wow. where they allowed rock bands to play every Saturday night. You know, how progressive were those yeah. Roman Catholics <laughs> in 1965? But it was the local, it was the, it was that being able to be six feet away from, you know, a local guitar player with his Gibson 335, a coil cord plugged into a Vox Super Beetle. That was, that really had more impact than say, watching Buffalo Springfield on a, on a television oh, screen. Yeah. You know, they were right there. And that's what that guitar sounds like. We were lucky we had a music store, two of them, in this town in Montana, which is not known for bearing, <clears throat> excuse me, very progressive rock and roll. But because of the air base, they had, they would come in and buy instruments. So we had two music stores that had the real stuff all the good Vox amps, the Fender amps, <clears throat> you know, Les Paul 335s, that sort of thing, you know. But my first real influence, <clears throat> still morning for me, is actually the Yardbirds were coming to town. It used to be a city 
where it was uh, these bands, British invasion bands, would use Great Falls, Montana as a pickup gig, meaning they're going to the West Coast, but they need motel and gas and so and so money. So they would stop and do this gig at the fairgrounds, get some money, and that would pay some expenses. So the Yardbirds were coming, and I was psyched. They, you know, they were my favorite of all that. Oh, yeah. So I talked to my mother, who I totally loved into going to the airport to meet them, just like the Beatles, you know, in New York. And so the plane pulled in, you could see them. There was a bunch of us kids from school. We saw the plane pull in, all of a sudden the doors open and there they are, these beautiful English rock stars. So they got down and we're all kind of <clears throat> screaming Beatlemania. So they got in a Chrysler Imperial, not a Cadillac limousine, but a Chrysler. And they were gonna go to the hotel, I said, mom, follow him to the hotel, I've got to get an autograph. So we followed him in her 65 Mustang convertible, which was totally cool. And as they got out, right on the radio, they were playing Frank Epperolin by the Yardbirds. And the disc jockey said, Jeff Beck, he's the greatest guitar player in the world. And I wrote down, I got my little pen, I got my pad, and <laughs> Jeff Beck. So as they got out, now they pulled into the Holiday Inn, I must have had huge balls on me because I ran over and I stuck my head right inside the car window. And all of a sudden, they all look like beautiful English rock stars. They all sort of looked alike. And I go, well, where's, where's Jeff Beck? And he raised his hand and I said, the disc jockey said, you're the greatest guitar player in the world. And so they kind of laughed like, oh, he thinks he is and blah, 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 blah. So as they got out, I go, I've established my hang. I'm hanging with them. So they're walking inside the hotel and I felt this huge bear paw hand on my shoulder, lift my 14 year old body up and drop me in the bushes outside. And it was there, the only roadie that they had at the time who was Richard Cole, who would go on to be their tour manager, Led Zeppelin. And I said, I just wanted to get their autograph. So at that moment, a guy who's with them, this is a true story and a great one, comes around and he's carrying a guitar case, uh, kind of a beat up Fender guitar case. And he's laughing at me. And I said, I just want to get their autograph. He says, oh, I'll get it for you, kid. So he goes inside. I watch him. He gets all the autographs. He's pointing to me outside the door and he comes back. He gives it to me. I said, hey, thank you so much. You're really cool. Could you sign it too? He said, yeah, okay. So he signs it at the bottom. And he tells me, go get, I said, I'm in a band. He said, go get yourself a Les Paul. Okay, I'll do that. I'll go look for a Les Paul right away, which there wouldn't be one in 1967. Right. <clears throat> and get yourself a Marshall Lamp. Okay, I'll get that too. So later on, I'm, we're in college and we're listening to Jeff Beck records <clears throat> like their scripture. Mm -hmm. And I go, I'm so embarrassed because I asked Jeff Beck for his autograph, you know. <clears throat> Like it was something out of a very teeny bopper kind of thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then I said, well, I actually, I didn't get it. A friend of his went and got it for me. In hotel. And I still had the autograph <clears throat> in my dorm room. And they pulled it out and it said, Jet back. And then at the very bottom, I said, and this is the guy who got me the autograph. He's their friend. And his name is Jimmy Page. Because <laughs> he was wow. playing bass on that tour. Right. Yeah. And I still had it. I think my little sister has it now. But and I remember going to the gig that night going, they're letting their friend play bass, which I thought was totally cool. And that was uh, 1967, I believe. But sorry for that long winded answer, but it had a good payoff, you know. <laughs> but it was really that British invasion until your last guest on your show, Steve Cropper. Till all of a sudden, see, we used to get an airbase radio station that played nothing but Sounds of Memphis. So besides Beatlemania, it's a coincidence, your last guest, I was listening to all of Steve Cropper's production, his guitar playing, and going, how is, how is, this, how is this guy doing this? And where is this wonderful music coming from? You know, I didn't know Memphis, I, didn't, I knew it was in Tennessee, but I had no idea that it was all coming from Mecklemore Avenue in South Memphis, courtesy of Steve Cropper's those licks, you know. Yeah. 
So it was a coincidence that your last guest was one of my earliest influences too, you know. And there were so many great guitar players at that time, you know. The big, you know, the big trio of Clapton, Jeff Beck, Jimmy Page, Quad Four, and the Hendrix, you know. And coincidentally, Hendrix's grave, his memorial, is only about 15 minutes from my house here in Seattle. And it is a great place to visit. Anybody on the T-Bone listeners and watchers in Seattle, go there because you always meet fellow Jimi Hendrix fans. You know, and it's kind of fun to hang out with them and share stories and everything. That was actually going to be the, the last question was about, about his uh, memorial, uh, because uh, I was going to ask, what's it like going there? And what, what family comes there? I share a birthday with him. Oh, and, really? Yeah, November 27th. Hey, that's a cosmic coincidence, Terry. Yeah, he was, he was born the same year as my mother, and the, but the same day as me. Really? Yeah. That is so cool. His, I first visited the, the grave, that, which was south of Seattle a little bit in a little suburb called Renton many years ago, back in the 80s. And I was very disappointed. It was a very small, inexpensive headstone that just said Jimmy, uh, Jimi Hendrix, forever in our hearts. And then uh, people used to go and they'd kind of chip away a little bit of it and, you know, kind of not vandalize it because they were fans, but it wasn't, and it was in the least expensive part of the cemetery because Jimmy's dad, Al, wasn't wealthy right. and Hendrix is his uh, manager kept all that money forever. So there was no extra money considering he was probably the most, one of the biggest rock stars of our time. So when the lawsuit happened and Al, his father, and Janie, his little sister, sued Mike Jeffries, they got a lot of that money back, I think $85 million. And Paul Allen helped them get that. So now they moved it to the, to the a more expensive part of the cemetery and built this beautiful memorial. And around it are the uh, future plots and headstones of all of his relatives that took care of, you know, he and his brother Leon and Janie during these kind of weird years in the 60s yeah. and the 70s. But it's pretty fascinating. I've actually even went to the church where the funeral was, and that's 15 minutes on the other side of me, and met the pastor that did the funeral service. Wow. And it's a very unassuming church. It was called Dunbar Baptist Church or Dunlop Baptist Church, one of the two. And uh, you can still see online the pictures from there. And I go, yeah, that's exactly where it is. And, you know, Miles Davis, they're Johnny Winter, Buddy Miles, they all went to that funeral, Mitch Mitchell. And I actually did a record that was a fantastic record and it was a live record. And this girl that was a singer came in, I listened to the mobile playback and she said, your guitar sounds really good. And I said, oh, thank you very much. And she left and the producer said, you know who that is? And I go, no, I said, that's Hendrix's little sister. Wow. It was Janie Hendrix. She mm -hmm. and her husband at that time were big in the uh, pretty progressive black gospel scene here in Seattle. So it was kind of cool, you know. Seattle is an unusual city for that. Got yeah. everything, you know, who knows. But that was long-winded answer. Those are my first influences were the British invasion stuff into the second tier of British invasion. Jeff Beck, Clapton with Cream, uh, Led Zeppelin. That was the really the ex ex sexy core of all that, you know and soul music oh yeah now uh there's a lot between that and the next subject so sure. maybe maybe we'll do a second part sometime sure. and cover more but i wanted to jump up to the 80s and the, yes. the metros yeah because i know they created quite a buzz and uh i, I actually watched part of a show that you guys did i think it was july 85 on youtube last night 
And uh, oh, I'll be done. Yeah, great. And uh, yeah, I uh, I know that you guys were on Star Search. Can you tell me a little bit about that? I can. <laughs> we that that band. It was a, it was a great band, live band. Oh yeah. You know, it was a fantastic band. Everybody was very talented. And we knew that this was our shot to get a record, a shot. This is our time. Because that's why a band does something, you know, when they decide they're not just going to be enthused, turbocharged hobbyists. They're going to do it serious. And because of Prince and the time, record labels were were paying attention to Minneapolis. Before that, there's no way. So we had a manager and we said, who said, I just can't get any record companies to come up and see you do a showcase in January in Minneapolis. So I have a guy from Capitol Records who is interested, if you can just get out here to LA or to New York and we're going, Oh my God, we got a four man road crew, six guys. But then we can't afford to be doing one nighters in Wyoming and Nevada to get there. So he had an idea because Star Search was going all over. And it was a huge TV show at the time. Oh, yeah. Like, the, like American Idol. And they're coming to Minneapolis, and the talent guy goes, we'll put the metros on the show. And at first we're going, absolutely not. It's demeaning this gladiator style, yeah. you know, competition. But the guy from Capitol Records said, if you can just get him out here and I can just meet him and look at him and see what they're like, then we'll do it. So, and another thing, it was January in Minneapolis, 50 below zero. <laughs> and the thought of being, going to Los Angeles proved to be, pretty tempting you know <laughs> so we did it the talent guy was a super hip guy and that helped quite a bit but it was so weird the staff it wasn't the acts on the show it's all of the staff had this great history of being in show business and working on american bandstand and and uh the Tonight Show and all that, and they always had great stories. But as far as uh, being on the show, they the rock band was like the lowest level of <laughs> snobbiness. You know, the, they had actors and comedians and all that. It was like a vaudeville show. Right. And the rock band, we, they looked at us like we were basically work the octopus ride at the carnival <laughs> <laughs> like you'd, you'd sit that would come out out of your mouth you'd go yeah i'm in the rock band and what would go into their ear is yeah i we clean the garbage here off the stage but it was a great experience and it did lead us to the guy from capital came showed up met him he passed that along to a producer who finally in July of, I think, 85, the producer flew up to Nashville when we were coming back from Florida to do a showcase. And so Star Search helped us get a record deal by Capital said, yeah, I met them, they, they look good, they play good, they blah, 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 blah. I think we should look into signing them, which led to, like I said, a showcase in a little club in, Nashville and uh, that got us a uh, record deal and the record deal believe it or not was through another television uh, a television company which was MTM, MTM which was yeah. Mary Tyler Moore right that time she owned television and her manager who was the vice president of the MTM records he said, you've got to get on the bandwagon with buying publishing in rock bands. That's the future, you know, because it was a big thing that Michael Jackson was buying Beatles songs. Right. And Paul McCartney was buying James Brown songs. So she said, OK, let's do that. And so that was the MTM was Mary Tyler Moore. And that was another great experience because they were really, really cool people, you know, and their budget for you know kind of a middle-aged rock band was really pretty substantial you know the video 
that's on YouTube, one called After the Passion's Gone, that budget was about $110,000. Wow. Can you imagine using that money now yeah. with a digital camera, with an iPhone? You know? So that the Star Search thing was, we were kind of embarrassed to do it because it wasn't, it wasn't cool. We wouldn't go, Springsteen wouldn't do that, you know, Peter Gabriel wouldn't, but it was a means to an end that was uh, necessary to get a record label to look at us. So I hope that that kind of answered the question. Oh, yeah. Supporting T-Bone's Prime Cuts on the Other Side podcast gives you interesting inside views from the talk space where musicians matter. Go to tbpcpodcast.com and click the donate button. All contributions are much appreciated. By the end of the decade, you had moved to, out to the Seattle area. Moved to Seattle, right. And was that, uh, was there much of a culture shock for you or anything when you got out there? What was that like? It, that's an excellent question. It was, when I had moved from Minneapolis, the scene, what I would call the Prince time, Janet, not Janet Jackson, Janet's records were still, still happening. They, the scene was sort of moving down a little bit and it was divided into two camps, the Prince punk funk camp and the replacements who could do soul asylum. That yeah. was another, that was another thing. And a lot of record labels had come up there and signed a lot of, a lot of bands that were in the middle of that. That really never sort of took off. So, but when I moved to Seattle, it was right before I remember the weatherman, uh, weather report going, this next winter is going to be the worst one ever. Mm. So I'm going, I don't think I can do another winter here. So I came out and immediately the weather was like perfect. There was a neat vibe. And Seattle, you have three cities, really huge cities. You have Vancouver, BC, which is a great rock and roll town due to that studio called Little Mountain Studios that produced all the Aerosmith, Motley Crue, uh, Bon Jovi records, Metallica. And then you had Seattle, which had a huge uh, rock uh, influence with Hendrix, uh, Hart, and then down in Portland. So they're really close. So you really felt more of a, a San Francisco kind of vibe. And a lot of people from Los Angeles were moving up here because it was more affordable. So you've got that influence from San Francisco and Los Angeles. But the thing I noticed the most, Terry, I noticed an open-mindedness that I was that I had not seen in the Midwest. In fact, the first gig, I didn't want a gig because I'd already played forever and I thought I'm going to give it a break. But I met a guy in a music store, he was a keyboard player, and he was really good. And I kind of recognized him from Minneapolis. And we talked and he said, I know you. And I go, yeah, I, I don't know how, but as it turned out, it was a guy named Mark Cardenas who had taken Jimmy Jam's place in the time. Right. And he was in Purple Rain. And uh, my wife was in Purple Rain too, by the way. So he said, I've got this gig. And do you want to, do you think of doing like, I, you know, I've played since I was 14 years old. I don't know. I, I don't want to go back to playing bars. He goes, no, it's not a bar. This woman songwriter has a writing publishing thing with Warner Brothers, with Warner Chapel. And I go, well, that's different. Yeah. That's different. And he said, and Charles Neville of the Neville Brothers is in it too. And I go, oh, I'm in. Because <laughs> I'm a huge Neville Brothers fan. Oh, yeah. I'm in. And so the first rehearsal, we were describing this song and how to play it. And I remember them using a term, they were going, it's kind of a hip hop beat. Now back then in 1990 or 91, hip hop was sort of associated with just, you know, not rock. Yeah. And I kind of thought that was weird. And being from the Midwest, you kind of had 
blinders on your ears, you know, kind of square. And I kind of went, you know, kind of shook my head like that. And the manager of this band was a guy named Ricardo Fraser, who is Sir Mix-a-Lot's manager. And during the break, I remember he sat me down. He goes, Danny, you're a good guy. I just want to help you out here in Seattle. You got to be open-minded and positive because if not, you're going to find yourself by yourself. And it was almost like scripture that he said that, you know, the burning bush. I go, that is so true. So to answer your question, the open-mindedness was great because you'd find somebody in uh, Soundgarden doing a gig with Sir Mix-a-Lot, you know, or something like that. So it was really a gumbo of, uh, oh, yeah. of ideas. And that's what I really liked about the town right away, you know. And there was, there was just something about it. So it was a culture shock. The only thing that was different in Minneapolis, Chicago, you have a work ethic because it's all Norwegians and Germans. <laughs> so they'll get out 50 below zero and shovel their sidewalk and go to the gig. The West Coast is a little bit more laid back like that. Where they're like, yeah, we'll get to that. Don't worry about it. So that took a little bit of adjustment. But I enjoyed, you know, the first rehearsal I did with, uh, with Charles Neville was I was looking around the room going, this is really an exceptional group of musicians. Oh, yeah. And he had just gotten a Grammy right before that for an album called Yellow Moon. And which uh, Daniel Lamois had produced. Oh, yeah. And he was so open and uh, we rehearsed. And I remember Aaron coming, Aaron Neville coming to one of the rehearsals and I'm going, how lucky am I? I'm <laughs> sitting 10 feet away from Aaron Neville and you can ask him any questions about New Orleans and that experience and that. And they're just, they're just as happy to be there as I am, you know? And it was through the drummer in that band, and we got signed to a and Records. It was a band called the Song Catchers. And the drummer in that band was Ben Smith, who later helped me get the gig playing with Ann Wilson right. from Mark. Ben, right after that, he'd been their drummer since the mid nineties, I think, something like that. But it's a fantastic town, a great, great rock town. Great guitar town too. Now, some sometime after that, you opened the uh, guitar store. <clears throat> yeah, the, at the uh, same time, I did. Okay, it was Danny's Music, right? Danny's Music, right? Yeah. Now you specialize in rare and vintage guitars, which is one of my loves. You oh, know, yeah. I, I played for thirty-two years before I had health issues. I can't play anymore, but uh, lots of gigs and stuff. And I I gravitated towards that that vintage stuff as I, you know, as I got into it. And uh, I know that you had a lot of celebrity clients. Huge. Who were it some of those? Huge. That store, I had no intention to do that, but I didn't want to go back to playing, playing bars right. for a living. And so I remember I was in a store and I kept comment, a, a, a guitar store, and I kept thinking how clean all the vintage guitars were because where we live here, the climate isn't as harsh as it is in the Midwest. Guitars get hammered. And I kept yeah. thinking, that's a pre-war Martin D18, and it looks brand new. That's a 56 gold top Les Paul. There's also clean. So I had this idea, and there was a little north of Seattle at a town called Everett. It's a little suburb mm -hmm. north. Uh, there was a building that was probably made in the late 1800s. Cool little brownstone brick, you know, brick walls, hardwood floors. And it had been, uh, it had been available for a long time. And I remember the landlord goes, you can have it. It was huge for $400 a month. And I go, and all I have to do is sell one Stratocaster and that's the rent, you know? So, the minute we, I opened it up and I went on a little buying trip 
throughout the Midwest and looking for guitars to stock it. And I had some pretty good collection of my own that I put on the walls. And it wasn't long after that, about a year, I got a phone call and my mother was at the store that day. And she said, it's a guy named Pierre Dupaport. And I go, the name sells is familiar. And I'm trying to think who that was. And I grabbed it and I go, hi, this is Danny. How are you doing? And he said, hey, I got your number from Alan Rogan. And I go, Alan Rogan, he's the, he's Pete Townsend's guitar guy, you know? Yeah. I go, oh, hey, how are you doing? He says, I need, do you have any of these? I heard you have a big K collection of these weird K guitars that had the big Kelvinator headstock, mm -hmm. the Barney Kessels, yeah. the swing. I go, I collect them. I've got them. Geez, I must have about 20 of them. Good. I want to get three or four of them. I said, I have a bunch and they're really cool. Now, this is before, hey, send me a picture on your iPhone. There yeah. was no iPhone. And it would have been take a Nikon, take a picture, go down to one hour photo, right. send it in the mail. I said, well, you'll have to trust me. They look brand new. And there was a book I was in, in the Jay Scott book about the K guitars. I think that's how he saw it too. So he said, here's a credit card. I'll just send them, send them to me. I'm out in the East Coast someplace in Connecticut. So I sent him and I said, can I ask if they're for somebody famous? And he said, they're for Keith Richards. And I go, that is awesome. <laughs> so wouldn't you know it, there was a, woman taking guitar lessons and she's at the counter buying picks or strings she hears the whole thing she works for the seattle times newspaper she said that's a great story do you mind if i pass that on to our entertainment guy i said man knock yourself out so about a week later this reporter shows up with a photographer <clears throat> he goes the store is really cool look at you've got all les pauls you got a d'angelico you got a pre-war pre-war martin and this newspaper story came out. And from that, all of a sudden, you'd a guy would come in, kind of a grunge era guy. And I go, I think that's Mike McCready from Pearl Jam. You know, who would have been just a big band, not one of the world's biggest bands at that right. time. And Mike became probably one of my best customers all through the 90s. You know, he just... As his career went up, he bought all the good stuff. And then he would tell Chris Cornell, which is a tragic loss that we lost Chris a oh, couple yeah. years ago. Chris Cornell. Chris Cornell would come in and buy a Gretsch. He'd tell Eddie Vedder. Eddie Vedder would buy a Telecaster. So it was really nuts. It, it was at the end of the week, I'd look at the receipts. I'd be disappointed if there wasn't somebody bought something that hadn't had a platinum record, you know, that week. And uh, they would tell other people, road managers. So all of a sudden you'd look over and you go, what are, what's Noel Gallagher from Oasis doing here? You know, they weren't part of the grunge clique. And it was really exciting, you know. And, uh, but the biggest one we ever, that I took place was a guy called one day and he says, do you have a Martin? a 50s Martin 12 string. And I go, I do. You know, they're not particularly the most expensive collectible, but they're cool. And I said, you know, I do have one. It's not a 50s, it's an early 60s, but it's pretty clean. I'll take it. So he said, can you send it down to Capital, Stu Capital Studios, attention, Jeff Emmerich? And I go, is this Jeff Emmerich? He said, yes, I said, You've engineered every Beatle record. So is this for Paul McCartney? He goes, yes, it is, but you can't tell anybody. I said, that's cool. I'll send it right away. Can you get me Paul's autograph? He said, yeah, not a problem. So I still have it. So that's what it was for. And I think it was for just a record, a demo. He was doing us some kind of folkish songs in the 90s. But through the through the stones, and I mean, I couldn't list them all. It, it sounds almost fantastic, but it was just so so normal, you know the the amount of rock stars that anybody from L.A. that would come up and hang out and Robin. Then the other guys who maybe weren't as famous, 
but to me they were super famous like i'm sending robin ford a guitar oh yeah bill frizzell is having lunch two feet away from me in my store you know john schofield you know larry carlton those guys who weren't as famous as Eddie Vedder, but to me, they were like, they were gods, you know, and you'd see them on TV, you know, you'd see your, your guitar on there. And, but so it was a very exciting time. And I, and the store sort of took care of itself and I would have still kept it, but I got, the, I think I'd mentioned, I got in a horrible car accident. So I was kind of out of it for about a year, you know, and uh, but yeah, the store was it was fun, and it was a neat old building. It had been a Chinese laundry in the turn of the century that had, must have had a huge weird story to it, because during that time Everett was a uh, mill town, and it was on the water. So I'd like to think in that Chinese laundry in the basement, it was a one hell of an opium den or brothel. <laughs> <laughs> But it had the vibe, baby. Let me tell you, it had the vibe, you know. No, oh, yeah. That's yeah. cool about, about uh, Schofield. I, I owned a store in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, great, for, great town. For, for a while. And every time that Schofield came to town, he rented a, a Mesa boogie from me. And oh, he, yes. He had, yeah. So he always gave me free tickets. And that was I, that was pretty cool. Isn't I mean, that something? I, mine wasn't vintage. Mine was mainly new stuff and I took some stuff in you know I wasn't there long enough to to do that I was there three years but uh before that it was there like 10 years but then guitar center came in and all the stuff you know I didn't have parking so it was kind of a bad. oh yeah but this, uh, uh, this it, my my story was just it was it, I had nothing to do with me having it be successful it was the time Seattle was super happening oh, yeah. People were moving here. They're making television shows here. Movies, Sleepless in Seattle, Northern Exposure, all that stuff. So it was the place to be. People were moving here, one, because the cost of living was less than L.A. And I remember I remember one day somebody going, hey, did you hear that uh, so-and-so moved here? Gene Hackman moved here. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Warren Beatty moved to... to to Bellevue and I'm going, this is just absolutely crazy. <laughs> but my store was just north of Seattle, not very far. And uh, it was just a, a fluke. It was like, you know, the guitar angels and yeah. guitar was a hip thing in the nineties. Oh yeah. You didn't have to be a techno wizard. That was last decade with the Shredder LA guys, with Kurt Cobain, there was the beauty of that music was like and you can do this too mm -hmm. it wasn't like if you got turned on to van halen steve Vai, you know all those great guitar players of the 80s you got to be a badass yeah your entry level is excellent whereas grunge that wasn't an issue so the idea of going and getting a 500 hundred dollar fender mustang was well within reach and it was the thing. In fact, speaking of Kurt, it, I never met Kurt. My mother did. She was in the store one day where he bought four or five Fender Mustangs or Jaguars or something like that. And I was like, that is insane. But now probably one of the biggest rock stars now in the world, I would say is Dave Grohl. Oh, yeah who gave me the car that I got in the car accident with. But not many people know this story. I'm going to tell you what a beautiful guy Dave Grohl is. He wanted a white Gibson Les Paul custom. Cool guitar. So I got, I found one. And he said, I'm going to come up Friday. I'll get it. And so when I got it, it had a bad case, bad guitar case. So I didn't have a good guitar case for it to go. And so there was a couple kids in the neighborhood that said, would you teach me teach guitar lessons? And I go, I'm the worst guitar teacher in the world. I'm a pretty good guitar player, but I'm a terrible teacher. You know, you won't learn anything. So, but this one uh, mother 
talk me into giving lessons to her son. I go, I'll do it for free, but I'm not very good. So I'm up one day teaching him some songs, you know, and one of the one of the people that manager I had downstairs came and said, Danny, Dave Grohl's here and he's looking for that guitar case. And he would have been in the Foo Fighters. This would have been about the time they would have been doing their third or fourth record. You know, they were officially badass. Oh, yeah. Big. And he said, I can't find the guitar case for it. I go, you know, it doesn't have, it has a bad one and I don't have a good one. Well, let me, let me go down and find it. So I went down and Dave was there with uh, Pat Smear. And I can't remember who else he was with. I think he was, I think Dave was there with his wife at the time, Jennifer. And I said, Dave, I don't have a good guitar case, but I'll loan you one of mine. And he goes, okay. So, so he says, you want to go get some coffee? I said, I can't, I've got a, I'm doing a lesson upstairs. And uh, he said, hey, what do I owe you for all the setup and the repair of the guitar? Said, you don't owe me anything. I go, wait a minute. I do know how you can, you can pay for it. Go up, take your guitar and go upstairs to my office and teach that little kid. Don't tell him, just sneak in and teach him the song. Teach him, we're learning Everlong by the Foo Fighters right now. So Dave goes, I'll do it. So he took the guitar, walked up inside my office and there's this kid and Dave Gold's teaching him ever long, you know, wow. and his mom is crying, you know, unbelievable, <laughs> but that shows you what a nice guy Dave Gold is. Oh yeah. Super nice, but it was a fun experience, but uh, I don't know if I could have done it, been a lifer in it, you know, because the cost of these guitars oh, yeah. started to skyrocket right around, you know, 2001, 2002, where, wow, if they cost that much now and it's just gotten exponentially yeah. big you know but it was a fun experience i tell you, you well let's, i was going to ask you about uh the mike mccurdy and the les paul story that was a great story yeah that was uh mike had bought a lot and he said you know i really could afford it so if you find a good 1959 flame top les paul and at that time, I owned one, and there was a couple on the on the wall, but they were super expensive, and they were what I would call museum quality, not player quality. Yeah. So I got a phone call one day from a girl with a with a uh, Scottish uh, Irish accent, who worked for Microsoft, and she said, "My dad has an old Les Paul." And he's coming to visit, and I'd like you to look at it, either buy it, or he can consign it at your store, because I heard you sell high-end things. I said, yeah. And so she said, his name is Jim Armstrong, and he used to play, he was the last guitar player in Them with Van Morrison, and he played on the first couple of Van Morrison tours. I go, wow, think about that. So I said, I'd love to. So Jim Morrison flew in from, Dublin, maybe in Belfast, I'd have to check. And he was a neat guy. And he didn't even buy a seat for this rare Les Paul. He just put it in baggage. So at the airport, we see it boom, 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 bouncing down the carousel. We open it up. All he did was put duct tape around it. But it was on, it was fine, you know. And so we went and had lunch. We talked that he came up by store consigned it picked it up and he told me the story of it he was on tour with van morrison he goes to a pawn shop on first avenue which back in the 60s and the 70s first avenue by parks market was a sea of pawn shops with vintage guitars tons of them he sees he's on a tour of one of those dick clark cavalcade of stars tours where it would be Van Morrison, the Supremes, Donovan, you know, all kinds of, like a vaudeville show. And he went to a pawn shop on First Avenue. He saw the guitar. And he bought it for $125. That's what they were going for then in 68, 67. He plays it on the tour. I mean, that's a coincidence right there that he bought it in Seattle. Now, 
He's gone back to Ireland and come back to Seattle. And he goes back, he quits playing, but he plays in the pub on the weekend. He plays there all the time. So he wanted, uh, I think at that time, he wanted to net about fifteen to $20,000, something like that out of it, which was kind of the going rate. You know, they weren't like they are now. For oh, yeah. So it sat there for a while. Mike was on tour, so he didn't get a chance. So when he came back, I said, you want this guitar. This is the one. It's worn in. It's perfect. He came up that day and got it and bought it right away. I have a photograph I'll have to send you of the day that he got it. My mom was in the store that day doing the books and she came down and he's playing the guitar, you know, and she's in the back photobombing or bunny ears. <laughs> but he took it out right away and gigged it. That was his big thing. He gigs with it. He doesn't put it in a vault. All right. He's like Kirk Hammett from Metallica with- Peter Oh Green. yeah, with Peter Green's guitar, yeah. He takes it out on the road, you know? And so a little bit later, George Webb, who's Pearl Jam's guitar tech, calls and goes, Gibson is thinking of doing a run of this guitar, exact clones. Could you tell the story of it? And I go, yeah, totally. So I told the story. In fact, Jim Armstrong had lost the guitar for a year. He was playing these in the pub every night, this Irish pub. And one of the bartenders moved it and put it back in the storage area. Jim couldn't find it for a year. He thought he lost it, you know? So he went out and bought an inexpensive Stratocaster. And one day he's in the back of the room and there he sees the headstock of the guitar sticking out. So he got it back. But I know every inch of that guitar. And Gibson did a faithful, exact replica. They did 50 and Mike signed them. And I, he did a YouTube thing about it and mentions me on that. In fact, I have, let me get it. Uh, sorry, Terry, but um, this, oh, is yeah. the, this is the one of the 50 that they made with all the wear marks, you know, the the wow. uh, belt buckle marks, all that. And then the headstock, let me see if I can get it in the light. Mike signed it, this is number oh, 20. Yeah. And everything is to a T, because while it was at the shop, I did gigs with it with, uh, I was playing at that time with Chris Barron in a band uh, from the Spin Doctors. And I remember doing the gig with this guitar and it weighs nothing it's like wow light as a kitten fart you know i'm serious <laughs> and uh yeah mine's number 23 i have a friend who has number five i think number five and most of the first ones all went to europe you know but it's an amazing guitar and i've owned a couple real 59s 58s those new, they're called the CC series yeah. collector choice. Those are exact, perfect replicas. I played my friend Joe Riggio, who does restoration. He has the Ronnie Montrose one. And they're scary how good they are. The Gordon Kennedy one. I played the Jimmy Page one. I played uh, the Gary Rossington from Leonard Skinner one. And they're great. They are expensive, though. That's the that's the down part. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you know. I'm friends it's, with uh, Greg Martin of the Kentucky Headhunters. I know he's he, the they best. made one too for him. Yeah, I think his is called Red Eye. I can't remember. No, Red, but, Eye, uh, Red Eye is the Ed King. Ed King one. Oh yeah, that's Greg right. Greg Martin's Greg Martin's fifty eight. I remember in the eighties seeing him when right after the Kentucky Headhunters had just kind of been blown up and I saw them at a theater show and I was really close and I was looking at Greg Martin's Les Paul going oh my god <laughs> but yeah his is beautiful and his replica is great you know and he is is he as cool a guy as oh he yeah comes? yeah he, Super nice. really really I mean on my radio show he called it a couple times for you know like when uh when Merle Haggard passed and stuff like yeah. that and he just, I asked him, would you do this? And 
immediately just did it. Yeah, he was great. His all of his little videos, he comes off as such a nice guy. Yeah. You know, and you always expect those guys, those super southern guys, to be just really macho and and you know, kind of tough. He just seems like the most mellow guy. Yeah. And what a left hand for vibrato. Oh, yeah. Got. You know, just insane. He has that. Um, I don't know, my thing is so plugged in. He has that uh um he has that Albert King um that Albert King lick, yeah. you know, uh uh he has that down to a science, you know, there's just something about the way he does everything is is uh, so amazingly cool. And he does it all on little tweed thinner amps. Yeah. You know, a champ or something like that, you know. Now, you mentioned uh, Chris Barron. That was going to actually be my next question about how you got hooked sure. up with him. He, he came in the store. And at that time, they had a video called Two Princes. Right. which was on the radio and MTV every two minutes. And he came in and he was wearing that. that oh, yeah. That, yeah, I remember that. that. Yeah. I had that hat for 20 years. I had that out here. I finally returned it to him because he had left it with me. And he came in. And for a second, I thought it was Lane Staley from Alice in Chains. They sort of resembled each other. But he had sort of an East Coast, Jersey, New York accent. And he was with a girl, his girlfriend at the time, who was super New York voice. And I said, I just saw you on MTV. And he goes, and he said, yeah. He said, I said, I'm in the Spin Doctors. I said, that's awesome. He said, well, I talked to you today on the phone. I need a Fender pre-CBS deluxe reverb or a pro reverb. I, got, I have them both. He said, I'll take them both. <laughs> and then he came back the next day. He said, do you have a Gibson Trini Lopez? I said, I do. They're not great guitars, but so he bought that. Then he came back and then we just became really close. You know, I would say at his place, he'd say at my place here. And we just hit it off really well. And at that time they were, they were huge. They were really big, oh, yeah. Grammy nominated. They'd gone from doing bars in New York to theaters to uh, arenas and he was just gonna go out and do dates with the stones which to me is like that's as big as you get oh, you know? yeah. and so his his drummer became we became good friends with him and the bass player and they were just they were a great band live and he was living he bought a beautiful farm in this very idyllic area right outside of Seattle, looking into the mountains. And he bought this farm. And one time he came in and I said, we should put together a band that does benefits. Because I had known in the Everett Women's Shelter, I had known the director. And he said, oh man, the money's running out, blah, 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 blah. I said, hey, I'll do, I'll do a thing. I got some rock star friends. You know, we'll see if we can put it together. So Chris said, yeah, let's do it. So in that band was Ben Smith from Heart and Mark Cardenas, who I gig with, with the Neville connection. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was in the time. And he said, let's really do this big. So then we got another keyboard player who had gig with Tower of Power. They were all pretty hitters, you know, heavy hitters. And Chris said, let's, let's do this, get horns. Three girl singers, the whole bit. Do some fun cover tunes. So the cover tunes were anywhere from Jimmy Cliff, Many Rivers to Cross, to Inner City Blues, Marvin Gaye, to Bob Marley, to anything. And it was a ball. And the, they were in the small theaters and sold them out and raised a lot of money. And we did it a couple of years in a row. And he was still riding pretty high on Grammy nominations with the band. They had gone through a guitar player change and then he just decided to move back to New York. But I still talk to him all the time. 
you know, wonderful guy, really wonderful guy, and much more musically well-rounded than the uh, kind of happy hippie that he comes off in the videos. Yeah. His music taste is much greater. He's from Princeton, New Jersey, and his best friend at the time was John Popper. Really? From the Blues Traveler. In fact, Chris moved to New York. John Popper said, you have to come up to New York. And they were living in the rattiest part of New York at that time, which was Alphabet City down in Rivington. And they were in a building. It was really cheap. The spin doctors were living in apartments there. The blues traveler and some of the guys from Fish. How That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Trey Anastasia lived in that building. They all lived in this really crappy building, you know, and they all right after that became really big, you know, big national acts, you know, but Chris is great. Chris is wonderful. And he yeah. does a weekly show, a weekly video show too. Oh, okay. Yeah. And he's more well-versed. He's almost like a Tin Pan Alley guy, you know, a kind of brill building go in, write songs, write them on a ukulele, write them on a Telecaster kind of thing. Just a very super sweet guy. Now, uh, speaking of uh, Ben Smith, mm -hmm. I, I know that he did gigs, you know, with uh, with that band, and he also did some gigs with, uh, with you and Charles Neville, didn't he? Yeah, he did. He was in every one of them. Now, when he introduced you to Ann Wilson of Hard and and then you you had that accent and everything. I, I want you just to lay that all out for us. Well, okay. The the gig we were playing with Chris, one of the benefit gigs mm -hmm. for the women's shelter. Ben said, Ben had, was in heart. And he said, I think I can talk Anne into doing this. It's a worthy cause. She's already not doing anything now. She was in... Uh, she had been doing another thing called the Love Mongers with right. Nancy and Frank Cox. And so Ben said, I'll talk to Ann. And so he did. She said, yeah, I'd like to do this. I'll do it with the Love Mongers set up rather than heart. Yeah. You know, Love Mongers is a much more accessible plug and play kind of band. So Ann came up, super nice. And meeting her was really like, uh, you expect this, this icon, right? but she radiates such warmth that melts right away. So she said, this will be great. And I, I said, you know, I'm going to push my luck. I'm going to talk you and Chris at this gig into doing a duet of I Got You Babe by Sonny and Cher. <laughs> and she did. She did it with wow. Chris. So after the after a her rehearsal, Ben came up to me and he said, "Listen, Anne kind of likes you and says you're an okay guy. You're what I always call if you keep a low nuisance index and you're always up <laughs> and happy, that opens the door to a lot of things. So would you play guitar in her set?" And I go, "I would love to do that. Are you kidding? Love on her set." So we did. They were great songs, unusual songs. Anne is another one of those people, her, her musical vocabulary is 360 degrees. So he did it. And then she had some gigs. Nancy was on taking a maternity leave and uh, Anne had some gigs she wanted to do. So she said, would you do some gigs with me? And I go, I killed to do some gigs with you. So. Ben made the connection because it's all about in this business. I found it's two things, the, the connections and networking and the willingness and an open mind and a good spirit chops. They're out. Everybody's got those technically everybody got that. So that's, that wasn't as important. It was the willingness, the half youthful spirit and uh, don't lay any speed bumps of, why you wouldn't do something. So Ben said, here, come on over. We're, we have a gig, a love monger gig. 
And I go, I figure it's going to be in some rehearsal hall someplace. No, we do it at Ann's mansion. I go, well, that's cool or trippy. So I got the address, big gate, huge gate in the volunteer park of Seattle. Buzz it in and they go, I hear a voice on this buzzer. It says, yep. And I go, it's Danny here for, for rehearsal. I thought it was an audition. And all of a sudden this gate opens up, I drive up and it's this beautiful, beautiful, huge white mansion looking down into Mont Lake and the lake. And, and she opens the door in a CBGB's t-shirt, two Martin guitars, come on in. And I go, well, this is awesome. We went in her living room. She's sitting there teaching me the chords to Crazy on You and Dog and Butterfly and all that. And I go, this is just so trippy. No big thing, no yeah. handlers or anything like that. Just her and I. So I figure it was because it's so low key. It's just a, I want to see what you're like one-on-one -on -one to see if you're okay or you're a pest or you're a drag. So I thought it was an audition and Ben goes, yeah, she totally dug you. You're doing the gig. And I go, that is so weird. So every practice was at Anne's house. She'd pull out a little PVPA, set it up herself, mic check. And it was a ball. That was with uh, Sue Ennis was in that band who was her writer with those hits in the eighties. This huge mega hits that they oh, yeah. had. And Frank Cox was the writer in that band. It was Ann, Nancy, Sue Ennis, and Frank Cox. And I still write with Frank Cox and uh, today. And then I, after the accident, I was actually on my way to Ann's to practice because she and I were going to do these duets for VH1 called the Storyteller Series. Oh, yeah. It's going to be that. a little tour that it was going to be kind of the star and then an acoustic guitar player in the background. Ray Davies was on that, Matthew Sweet, Darius Rucker. And I was really looking forward to it till got in the accident. The steering box went out in the car, the car Dave Grohl gave me. And it was a vintage, beautiful car. And I drove it forever. You know, it was a 62 fastback Ford Futura. And I was on a commission for about a year where I couldn't, not only couldn't play, but from hitting my head on the side of the, the car. Oh. And I had seatbelts on, Terry, but it's still, they were those old just lap kind. Because yeah. it was an old vintage car. It threw me against the side of the passenger door. So not only physically couldn't play, it messes up your head where I couldn't even, I couldn't even fathom why I wanted to play in the first place. It was like, I'd look at a guitar like it was a pair of skis or something like, it just didn't dawn on me. And then later on, about two years later, everything started to come back a little bit better and my hands started to come back. So uh, it was a missed opportunity, but, uh, and then, if they came back, I played really well, but I enjoyed those gigs. My first gig with Ann was, I think we did a small benefit, like a uh, unplugged acoustic thing, the four of us for a literary women's music magazine. And then the next gig was in front of 20,000 people, you know, and, and it was really cool. In fact, we did we did the opening for when Paul Allen built that EMP, that big those big series of concerts with MTV with you know Metallica, Kid Rock, Pink, Chili Peppers, U2. You know everybody played at this gig. That was one of the last gigs I did with her, and it was a gas. It was really fun. But in January, out of nowhere, through thanks to Frank Cox. I got to, okay. I hooked back up. Yeah, this just January, yeah. I was re, got re, re hooked up with Anne and we wrote a song together. And she's in Florida working, she was working on new material and she was going to cut the tracks in Muscle Shoals, which that's awesome. Yeah. 
And so Frank said, hey, send Ann this tune that he and I have been working on. And I sent it and she said, I like it. I want to change a couple of things. I said, you could change anything you want. And so over the course of about a month, six weeks, we just back and forth sent versions of this song because I'm pretty fast. I use logic as a, as a, as a uh, digital audio work mm -hmm. station, which is a great editing recording thing. So I was able to send her back and forth and she'd make suggestions, whip them back. So through that month, it was really a gas to work with her again. Her lyrics are fantastic. So uh, it started out as a song called Imperial Highway and then she changed it to A Moment in Heaven. And uh, we'll see if it passes the producers, right. you know, because they're the end all, you know. But she used a guitar player who's one of my idols, a YouTube, He's a big guy in Nashville, and I'm sure you know him too. A guy named Tom Bukovac. Oh, yeah. Tom played on the sessions, and Gordon Moat, you know, she used these heavy hitters from Nashville to go to Muscle Shoals and use them. But imagine being in that room hmm. that Son of a Preacher Man was cut, you know? Right. And part of Sticky Fingers, the Stones, Rod Stewart records were in there, Bob Seeger records were cut in there, everybody you know, cut records in there. So it was neat. She's moved from Florida down to, or moved from Seattle down to Florida. She lives in Florida now. I think the rain might've got to her, Yeah. you know, but she's, her lyrics were just razor sharp, perfect. You know, she's a great songwriter. I heard, so it was really good to, re, to reconnect. I know? heard live versions on the internet last night of, uh, you playing with her, uh, that was God Give Me Strength. Oh, and uh, unreal. and the uh, uh, Crazy on You, Crazy on You, yeah. The that was recorded at in Seattle here at the Showbox, which was an old vaudeville theater that they restored, and it was the rock and roll part of the rock and roll women's music awards. And uh, Ronnie Spector was in the audience. Oh, wow. You know, it was really cool. But that version of God Give Me Strength and Crazy on You, there's a bunch of others that I had gotten from a bootleg. A guy brought in, a, uh, he sent it to me. He brought, he had a digital tape recorder here and two microphones in his sleeve. And he sat back by the board and held the microphones up. So it came out pretty good and I remastered it. But she had bronchitis. If you listen to those and hear her do crazy on you and God give me strength, which is an impossible song to sing. Oh yeah. She just nails it. You know, she absolutely nails it. And like, holy smokes. And she had bronchitis and she still did it, mm. you know. But yeah, those are just bootlegs from this guy with a recorder, you know, <laughs> that I ran the, the uh, DAT recording into my suite, my mastering suite and got it to sound better, you know, cause you can hear crowd noise and everything. But yeah, she's, she, she can do no wrong in my book. She's awesome. <laughs> Supporting T-Bone's Prime Cuts on the Other Side podcast gives you interesting inside views from the talk space where musicians matter. Go to tbpcpodcast.com and click the donate button. All contributions are much appreciated. Now, I, I first uh, became aware of you with uh, Beauty and the Bastards. Yes, right. Yeah, that was good. And, uh, Redemption Road. And uh, that's back when I had a radio show on uh, WICR FM. And uh, it quickly became one of my favorites. When, you know, I played it a lot on the show. And I, how did how did you guys all come together? That one was, and I, I have to tell you, I can't thank you enough. You have no idea how you got the ball rolling on that, that CD. I get an email from, from people all over Europe and the United States. So that those two CDs did really well. 
I went to, uh, we were in a band. The bass player, the drummer, and I were in a band in the 70s that were really just a, what I would call your boot camp. When a rock band is sort of in a boot camp and you right. learn your crap by going out, playing shitty places in Iowa and North Dakota to figure out, am I going to do this? Because if you're doing one-nighters in the middle of North Dakota in the winter, you're going to do it or you're not going to do it. So we actually got a pretty good local following that uh, eventually morphed into me moving, moving to Minneapolis and starting the Metros. But that band did pretty good. And then the drummer and the bass player got to that part in their age where they go, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to just have a normal life. And the bass player moved to California, got into computers at Silicon Valley at an early age. Oh, yeah. And I, th I was getting pretty good at recording on Logic. And I said, I can put together the demos pretty well here. And we can meet at a studio to lay down real tracks and all that stuff. And I had at that, that time met a, a group of these incredible singers. So the bass player number said, who should we get to sing? And I go, I know all these singers up here and I think they'd get a kick out of just coming over, low key, put a head, set of headphones, grab a condenser mic and sing. So it was a core band, but with all these different singers. Uh, Shannon Hayes, um, Shannon Hayes was on it. Uh, Gordy, Gordon Christensen, who was great. All these people were on there, and it turned out to be kind of a neat little project. And a local station played it here, then you played it, but you really that got people interested in it. And uh, we did the my nephew did the cover, I thought oh, it was the covers of the CD it looked really cool, oh, yeah. and he did those. So it was a very self contained project, you know. And we did two of them one of them, Redemption Road. And the first one, I don't think has a title, but we still did some covers and a couple originals. And uh, it was just really fun. And it did, like I said, on the Reformation, it did really, really well, you know. But I can't thank you enough. No, you sure. really did a great job, you know. And a lot of people have radio shows go, go uh, hey, I really played the shit out of that record. And I go, no. T-Bone Mathley played the shit out of that <laughs> Leslie Flurry played the shit out of that record. And so it really helped and sold out. And all of the downloads were great, you know. But they were all done in really a small room. The one that we were going to do a third record that just didn't turn out. That just, we didn't have the songs ready. And that was done in a studio where we all got together. And it didn't quite have the sound. It didn't have a, a it was a little sterile. You know, rock and roll's got to have some edges to it. You know, a couple right. mistakes here and there. You know, but I'm glad you liked it, and I can't thank you enough for all the good stuff that you did with that. Oh sure. Know? And the singers, some of those singers had never had a chance to. They never had a chance. They were good singers. They got to be good enough to do gigs, but they'd never. The thought of them being on a record that gets played 2,500 miles away where the airwaves go all over the internet, that blew their mind. So the good that you did, you, you have an idea, but you don't know how good that made them feel. They just didn't think that would ever be possible. Some of these singers were only 22, 23 years old, you know, and they did. You, so you may have really made made them feel really yeah. good by doing that. Thank you. Yeah. I mean that that show had a following here in Indianapolis, but they they had the station had such a good internet presence that I actually had many more listeners from around the world than it did locally. I get things from all over Europe. You know, there was a difference. Your show, you dug no pun intended because we had a song called Dig a Little Deeper on it, but 
you dug deep and you weren't just a niche show. Right. It Probably was like one well. second you'd play Highway Star by Deep Purple. The next minute you're playing Betcha by Golly Wow by the Delphonics. Yeah. So it's like, you know, this cat where he's at, he's really getting the smorgasbord of all the stuff. You know, Memphis soul, real soul music from Philadelphia, mm -hmm. as well as Michigan hard rock. You know, so you dug very deep and that's where your listeners, they love that stuff. Educational. Now, uh, your solo CD, uh, Lucky Me, was really another one of the favorites of the show. Oh, thank and, you so much. And uh, your version of the Marvin Gaye tune, uh, The Trouble Man, th oh, man, that's killer. Hey, come on, that was good, wasn't it? Yeah, but I have to admit that my favorite on, on that CD is Pray For Me. Oh, Pray that For one, Me, yeah. That one I still play a lot, and that lead break is amazing. Oh, thank you so much. That was all done in a small room, too. That one, that's got a kind of a celebrity connection, too. Pray for me. I got a Facebook message once from a guy named Jonathan Paul Acre, who I knew from Minneapolis. He was one of Prince's engineers at Paisley Park. He said, I want to and we were talking about not recording. We were talking about Revox reel-to-reel tape machines for some reason. And I said, hey, can I send you a demo of this new, I'm doing a new record called Lucky Me. I'd like you to hear it. I figure if this is the guy that's been at Paisley Park helping mix Diamonds and Pearls and Sign of the Times, I trust this cat. Oh, yeah. He was one of the ones we all heard about, you know, that was into the, uh, he was in the in crowd at the temple. I call Paisley Park. So he goes, yeah. So he said, pray for me. That's my favorite song. Wow. So I sent him the individual wave file tracks. Here's my drum track. There's my four guitar tracks, blah, 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 blah. Send it to him. So he's the one that mixed and mastered that song. That had a, that song that you mentioned that has a uh, Prince connection because oh, that's yeah. who, who mastered it. And that song was written driving down Rainier Avenue. All the lyrics and the chords came together. And I went over to, I played everything except for the keyboards. And I used Roger Wood, who is one of the black belt, black gospel Hammond B3 players oh, yeah. in the area. He's, he's really good. And he goes, oh, I'll play on that. And one neat claim to fame for him, he was on, he used to play with Dorothy Norwood, who's a black gospel singer. Oh, yeah, I played her on the show. Yeah, yeah Dorothy Norwood. Well, he, he was Dorothy Norwood's keyboard player. And he was on the tour, the Stones Get Your Yaya's Out tour, because it was Dorothy Norwood, Stevie Wonder, and the Stones. Wow. And he was yanked off that tour by his dad, who was a pastor, when they found out that they were, <laughs> I mean, imagine the debauchery on a 72 Stones tour. Yeah. So his dad came and got him and his brother, Greg, off the stage, but that's who played on that. But that track, that's got a lot of power to it. And I think that break, solo break, you're hearing, that was just for the tech geeks out there. That was this, excuse me one second while I grab it. This, that Telecaster with a humbucking pickup pick in the back or blade pickup. Yeah. Through a noble overdrive into a little Vox AC4. Wow. That was all cranked. Everything was cranked and back pickup. And I think I only took two or three takes on that and that's it. And uh, yeah, really that's about it. Not, not many frills, condenser mic thrown in it and uh, a little bit of reverb, a little delay and, and that was it. But I'm glad you liked it. That record and the Marvin Gaye cover, I've wanted to do that song for since I heard it in college, but it's a hard song to do. Yeah. You know, 
that ba da 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 that part is really hard to figure out. So it took me a long time to get that. And to sing it is really hard to sing. <laughs> because I wasn't really primarily known as a singer. Yes, a telecaster you could throw like that on, on a bed. <laughs> because in the 80s, I had throat surgery because I was the singer in the metros. And one day, I, nothing came out. I couldn't even talk. That's why this voice sounds like this. And I thought something's really weird. And I, not to get gross, but I had a smell as I was smelling and the smell metallic, like a penny. And I knew it was blood. So I went to the doctor and he put a fiber optic tube up my nose and down into my stomach where there might've been, where there was blood down there. And I remember the doctor and he was looking at my throat and he pulled it out and he said, Jesus, Danny, your throat looks like Woodstock. <laughs> and he, so it was a mess. So I couldn't sing anymore. And I knew that if, if I was just a singer and a kind of a, a guitar player, I wouldn't be able to keep that gig. So we got a singer, Jody Hanks, who was in the Metros, who I just did a record with. Right. And we're working on another one. And we, and I had to learn how to play guitar better fast because this happened about 1982 and 83. And slacker blues guitar players were not in vogue at that time. It was the LA Valley sound, Steve Lukather, Mike mm -hmm. Landau, these heavy hitters, as well as Eddie Van Halen, you know. so. You had, to be, you had to be a badass. So I remember going, I'm in a big band and I'm taking guitar lessons, you know, to get my sound right. So thank God it saved that gig. And the voice never came back until Ann Wilson in 99, because I figured it's lost, it's gone, it's not coming back. And we were at her house rehearsing and she just said, Danny, sing a, sing a part on, uh, you know, it was a neat cover. I can't remember what it is right now, but it was a neat, oh, Feel Like Letting Go by Paul McCartney and Wings. Uh, and just sing, oh, I feel like letting go. And I go, I don't have a voice. I can't do it. But it came out. And I go, I think I can sing. <laughs> you know, how did that happen? Because it took that many years of rest, you know, 10 years, because there was nothing. It was nothing. And I had surgery three times. And they just do polyps, polyps and nodules, and it took it away. So on like Pray For Me and uh, I Belong You That, that comes pretty easy to do. You know, I can, I don't go any further than that, even though that Marvin Gaye song, that's, that's some, that was some stretching, yeah. you know, on my part. You know, but I'm glad you like those songs as you pick the ones I like. I like those too. The Marvin Gaye one, there's a station here that is a uh, internet station that's been, you know, an icon here for 40 years. Not internet, but a regular radio station. And the Marvin Gaye tune was the one, was their most requested song on one wow. of the show for last year, you know. And it, uh, that made my day. It's a cover, so people are interested. And I think they look at it and go, they're curious, like, well, that's pretty ambitious. Let's see how this guy either fails or succeeds. Because you're gonna you're gonna do one or the other, not in the yeah. middle, or something like that, you know. And the um, you have a big soul connection, you know, being close to Philadelphia, being close to that. So your knowledge of soul is pretty is much bigger than the average bear so you get you know all of that seven, sound of 72 car radio stuff you know i know that you love that as much as i love it too oh yeah definitely stylistics delphonics yeah. oj's all that stuff you know shy lights you know now oh, another one of your solo cds which actually made my you know my list of favorite 
Uh, oh, thank you. you. I saw it. Yeah. Uh, was the, the your your most frequent one? Here comes tomorrow. Here comes tomorrow. And I mean, and some of those were were mastered and mixed by Jonathan Akery from uh, Paisley Park as well. Now I know that you played all the instruments except for what the bass on one song, except for drums. Okay. Except Drums and the bass. There was a tune called uh, "If I'm Late, Don't Wait, Go On Without Me." Uh, I tried, and my bass playing skill. I just I just sound too like a bad duck done. You yeah. know, root five, root five. I said I just can't do it. So I have a friend named uh, Shane Wisniewski from Minneapolis, who's a great guy and a great bass player. And he has a beautiful home studio. I said, could you play on this? And he goes, in a heartbeat. So he got his old Alembic bass, Avalon preamp, and whipped it up. And I go, yep, that's a real bass player sounds like. And I'm pretty good at my drum tracks that I do because I bought loops or great drummers have given me loops like, uh, Aaron Comas from the Spin Doctors who oh, yeah. give me loops, or Ben Smith, or uh, I've got some from Tom Waite's son, Casey Waite, where I use that on a couple of things. On uh, the Tom Waite's cover that I do on that song called uh, Get Behind the Mule. Yeah. Is that's his, I use his son, Casey, as a loop. And I'm pretty good at editing and cutting samples and all that stuff, because drums are the hardest. You have to have a big room. You got to mic them up. Whereas if you just, you know, use some loop samples, build them, make them your own, then you can get going on the, on the song. But uh, yeah, that's got a Prince Baisley Park connection too from Jonathan. He mastered it. He has a beautiful studio in Phoenix. And uh, he did, he mixed about three or four songs, I think, on it too. But he's a great engineer and a great producer too. He is an interesting story. He got COVID on his deathbed in a hospital in Phoenix. You know, their, their mask laws in Arizona are like, were non-existent. So he gets it, he's back on his deathbed, three, you know, last rites, but he gets better so after a month. So they said, you can go home. He's leaving the hospital. He gets in an Uber. The Uber driver gets in a wreck, snaps his neck. He's in a coma oh for five God. months. In a coma for five months. And then he wakes up, tubes, stuff, respirator. And he can't move his legs. They're atrophied. He tries to throw them over the bed. They don't work because they haven't worked for a couple months. Then he falls down, breaks his arm in about 90 places. Oh. He's the book of Job. You know, you and I think we've had some health things, yeah. you know. But so finally he's back to normal and his ear, his ear is great. In fact, he just loaned me a for tech guys out there to cut vocals on a vintage, one of those AKG C12 mics, you know, which are, you know, legendary, oh, yeah. like the old Raymonds, you know. But I told him with my scratchy voice. You know, I could sing in a broken SM58. <laughs> You're not going to tell the finesse of like, you put it in front of Sting or something like that, you know. But I'm glad, and thank you for putting that in your, my, in your, one of your top 12 of the year. That made my day too, you know. It, I'll tell you, I'll, I enjoyed all the songs, but, but there's one song on there that kills me, and that's better. I didn't expect that as I'm listening through the album. And that came on, and I was like, whoa, what's that? And that that one I listened to again like three or four times last oh, thank night. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh that was just an acoustic guitar track mm -hmm. that there's no no percussion. I think there's just a Martin guitar on two tracks, a bass, a Gretsch. Uh, here, this Gretsch, <laughs> if you can see that, yeah. uh, that Gretsch Country Club, 62 Country Club, on the middle part, and a synth pad that's holding it out. But 
that one was another one that was easy to write. And that's one of my favorites too. That, uh, in fact, I just redid a version of that that we were going to pitch to uh, Anne for her record, but it didn't quite get done enough, you know, but yeah, I always thought that was a great line, you know, I can't remember I read the course. I was made for something better, better than the things that I've done wrong. Because everybody makes mistakes and they kick mm -hmm. themselves over the past. But this will do till better comes along. You know, I thought that was a pretty neat line. And that was one of the ones that came from the universe, just yeah. throws you a bone, you know, and go, I think this is a good hook. You know, I wrote it originally. It wasn't on an acoustic guitar. It was on a, a Hammond organ, but not a B3. It was one of the Hammonds that was the grandma and grandpa model 3000, you know, that was just like in the house where two sounds sound good, the rest of them sound Lawrence Welk. <laughs> and this guy gave it to me for free over on the peninsula. And I go, horrible, bad, sucks, can't use it, don't want to use it. Wow. This sounds good. So it was the chords were written on that, on that Hammond. And I just transferred that track to get the chords right and everything. And it came out good. But I'm glad you picked that song because that's my favorite too. And then I have a vocal thing at the beginning that's just me molting right. voices, really quiet, not distorted. You know, the beauty of multi-track recording. Yeah. Uh, but I'm glad you like that. Thank you. How did you decide to cover If I Only Had a Brain? Because I thought that was very interesting, too. That was uh, somebody had had suggested that because in the metros, we needed a, a sound check song because it was a big band. It was six guys, big, huge PA. Our PA, by the way, was we bought Prince's side field monitors that was our pa when he was just like having a garage sale but we needed a sound check song in case we were doing a gig where we didn't get to do a real sound check so we needed a sound check song so i was noodling with somewhere with the rainbow but we did it more like the way deep purple <laughs> do it and everybody would go you have to do that song from the Wizard of Oz on your record. I go, I can't, I need a whole band on that. So this girl goes, you should do If I Only Had a Brain. And then somebody said, you know, Bill Frizzell does a copy, uh, a version of it. And I go, well, I'm no Bill Frizzell. Nobody is Bill Frizzell. Yeah. So I just figured out how to do it. And I found that it was in my, my key or in my, my voice. And I didn't have to do anything with adjusting the pitch, no cheating. It was just, uh, I would while away the hours and conversing with the flowers. And that was just a, that was a Gibson L5 mm -hmm. on the guitar for you tech, guitar tech guys yeah. out there. A Gibson L5. And that was it. Some effects on it. And my favorite. Uh, my favorite West Montgomery chord change coming down at the very end with me. I'm a bad keyboard player. I'm like one of these guys, <laughs> you know, I play keyboards like chickens walk, you know, <laughs> not this, but that. And set it on a synth patch and that was about it. But it came out great and people seem to really like it. Oh, yeah. You know, it gets airplay. It's one of those irresistible songs, you know, that there's nine different verses because if it's only had a heart, if I only had a brain, you know. And I can't remember who wrote, who wrote it. I don't think how, Harold Arlen wrote it. Oh, no, I think he did write it, you know. But you got to dig back and get the copywriting and all that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. But yeah, I think I ended the record with that one. Yeah, that was the last song. I ended the record with that one. I'm one of those guys that I, I'm totally immersed in the song while I'm doing recording it, playing it, getting the parts, holding it down. But once it turns into a CD, I'm almost like a basset hound where I like go back, go on to something else, you know, where there's other songwriters or producers 
their whole thing is what to do with the CD after it's made. Oh yeah. You know, the, you know, having that flower grow, I'm still more of the getting the seed in there and watering it and writing it, you know, and kind of perfecting it, you know. I think you'd have to be a Todd Rundgren to do everything, yeah. you know. Well, by the way, have you seen the way he's doing his new oh, tour? Yeah. yeah. Love it. Yeah, he's got, he's got- Todd Rundgren too. He's got- so many of them. He's got Elliot Lewis, who I know because I, when I worked for Hall, he's, he's, your, he's your guy from yeah. Hall & Oates. Yeah. yeah. Elliot is playing keyboards. Mm -hmm. Elliot's with guitar player, too. Oh, yeah, he is. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that was your connection was you knew, you met Daryl Hall, John Oates. That was through the Elliot, Elliot connection, right? No, actually, I, I worked for G.E. Smith, and then uh, and, uh, John needed uh some work done and saw what I had done for G.E. Smith and got my number and then called me when I was living in Nashville. And of course, I didn't think it was him. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you were, you lived in Nashville for a while? I, I was, I was there for about a year from, in, from like middle of 2007 to middle of 2008. And then yeah. I moved, moved here to Indianapolis after that. You, I lived in Nashville when we got our record deal in the metros, we thought, hey, we're we're gonna we're signed. We're gonna go to Los Angeles. We're gonna chase girls on Sunset Strip. We're gonna party. <laughs> no, the producer said, "I'm moving to Nashville because the cost of living. I've got kids. It's safer." And we're like, Nashville, and that was in the '80s. Yeah, there was no alt country then. There was no rock and roll then. It was, but a lot of LA or session guys had moved there. And so I li we lived at the uh, Vanderbilt Plaza Hotel for about a year that was in, help me out, Bellmead. I in think the Bellmead so. Area. Yeah. You know, nice neighborhood. And to put Nashville in perspective, as you know, we were walk, I was walking to the studio for the first day. We were recording, I think either at the at Master Mix, I think in music by music role, mm -hmm. you know, was it 18th street, 17th street? 12th uh, street, I think. 12th street. Yeah. And we were walking there and there was a guy, this was at 10 in the morning and he's all dressed up in like kind of Marty Stewart superlative outfit with the nudie kind, but they were sort of like bargain basement nudie stuff. And this was not hip in 1985 or six he looked like he had made this outfit with fringe and <laughs> rhinestones there's grease back and he's holding a box he's at a sit he's sitting at a bus stop he's got a cardboard box and we've got our guitars larry stop and i and he said hey musicians we're looking over and said where are you all going i said we're going to the studio he says do you have a record deal and we go Hey, for the first time in my adult life, I can say, yes, I do. You know, he said, yeah, I'm going to get one of those today. And he lifted up his cardboard box and there's like cassettes, poorly made cassettes, a couple homemade 45 records and a bunch of uh, poorly made. I went to the mall at Glamour Shots and had an eight by two. <laughs> and so he's got those. He said, I'm going to go up on Music Row and uh drop these off go back to the hotel crack a miller and sit back and wait for the calls <laughs> go, dude are you serious yeah i've been waiting so, for a while <laughs> yeah so I, so I saw him kitty corner he's on a different bus stop except this one he's got the webster's dictionary of the hangdog look oh yeah and i walked by and i go hey dude how you doing partner and he said they wouldn't let me in none of them places. And I go, do you think that they actually would? This is where they all go. Yeah. Everybody, you know, in LA and New York, it's badass. Yeah. But in Nashville, the, the fairy tale of the every man is so big that they think that Garth Brooks is just going to let him into their house. Yeah. You know, so the, he was just so disappointed in that, you know, that, that he just couldn't show up with a couple songs and he would be the next Randy Travis or whoever was big yeah. at that time, 
you know. But you know, I, another neat story with M Capital, MTM had their own set of publishing concerns. And you know who worked in the publishing department? Was uh, our producer, this guy named Tommy West, asked me, said, I can't go see this band. We want to go see this band. Go check them out. We're thinking of signing them. I go, hey, then I get to be like an AR guy, you know. So I didn't have a car. So one of the two of the girls from the publishing picked me up and we went to a club. And this band was great, but they were raw. And they didn't sign them. I said I would have because I think that that's a great band. And it was that band called the Georgia Satellites. You remember that? Oh, yeah. And, there, who, and they missed a big opportunity. They should have signed them. But the two girls that were working in the publishing department, they gave me a ride. And we talked about music and that. And, and one of them was Trisha Yearwood. She worked in the publishing department wow. at MTM. I think she got a start there, you know. But their whole thing was buy songs, buy real estate, and all that kind of thing. You know, none of their acts that they signed as artists never did anything besides, you know, maybe make the top 40 in Billboard. You yeah. know, and they just were, they were equipped to get the songs, work the songs, but not the artists kind of thing. But it was a good experience. Nashville is a weird town, that's for yeah. sure. You know, yeah. Yeah, there's so many people moved down there to make it. I, I remember going down there. I played at the uh, Family Wash, and uh, the busboy there said, oh, can I see your guitar? And, oh, my God. He, he was one of the best guitarists I ever saw, and he was working there as a busboy because so many people go down there to make it, and it doesn't happen. They have to take other jobs to try to stay. No, that's, the, that's it. Yeah. If they can get a job as a waiter if yeah you know that's a big one they i've had three or four friends that have moved down there now to franklin which is just south of oh yeah mm -hmm. and uh but thank god the times got progressive and so now the the songs i think in coming out of nashville are better the players are better except that always one thing kind of killed me about nashville the beauty of country music is what the simplicity yeah that's the beautiful thing. You look at a song now, a song so-and-so by Keith Urban or whoever, and you look, the writers, there's like 20 writers. Yeah. <laughs> it took you 20 writers to do that? <laughs> you know, really? You know? Yeah. George Jones, it took him and a guitar. You yeah. know? You didn't need 20 writers. But the world is different between 200 miles of Nashville to Memphis is almost like Two different planets. Oh yeah, you know, two different planets. And I loved the guitar stores in Nashville when Gruen was at the old location. Yeah, and there Gruen ruled then. When you were there, I think Carter Vintage would have been there, which is a great store. And Tom Bukovac owned a store too, mm -hmm. and I can't remember the name of it, but. Uh, that's where all the guitars wind up, you know, is like yeah. in that part of the country from the East Coast to the West Coast, North and South, they all wind up down there. Yeah, yeah. I went to uh, to Gruen's once and I went with John Oates. So we get to go up to that third floor where average person, you know, doesn't get to go. Like I wouldn't have been able to get up there yeah. and I got up there and I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> that <laughs> is the, that, yeah, that's the troll. Yeah, the third floor. John Oates, yeah, he'll be able to get up to that, that yeah. third floor. I'd only been there once, and it was only because George was not there. Mm. He was not there, but an associate that he had, that he and I had swapped guitars in the 90s, I walked in and saw him, and he remembered me and everything, and I said, let me go up on the third floor. And he said, yeah, come on, we went up there. Yeah. There was nobody there. Not a soul, but it was like, holy smokes, you know, it was, it was the stuff, that's for sure, you know, and he was, I used to still collect his newsletters oh, from yeah. the early 70s, they were just practically printed on a copy machine, you know, whereas a 1959 flame top Les Paul then was $1,500, right, a 57 Strat. That's four fifty to five hundred dollars, <laughs> something like that. 
you know, isn't that crazy? Yeah. But, you know, we don't, you and I don't really own these guitars. We own them temporarily, but we're really trustees. Yeah. They're not going to disintegrate. They're not cotton candy. Like I have, I have parlor guitars in the other room from the 1800s. They're still there. They didn't fall apart. So odds are, if nobody does anything to them, they'll be around for another hundred years. So yeah. that kind of blows me away. Yeah. You know, there was a beauty in the guitar of say my age group and yours, where in high school, unless you were the rich kid, the jock, the homecoming king or queen, or the brain, you were really in the great unwashed. You were in the mushy middle, you know. Except all of a sudden, you got a silver tone guitar or a Fender Mustang. Well, then that didn't make you into the group that was the homecoming king, the rich kid, the jock, but you didn't care. You didn't care. You, you had this guitar and that was your whole life. And then you found somebody else that was in your tribe that played guitar. A guy you didn't even know in school in junior right. high. And you get in a band. And then all of a sudden, somebody goes, hey, they're in a band. Those two get Danny and so are in a band. And they have a drummer, a real drummer. Wow. <laughs> then all of a sudden, you become your own. You're in your own rich kid, jock, homecoming king. You know, my first gig, which I think is kind of interesting. I had a airline guitar, like Jack White plays. Right. From Montgomery Woods. And it only had a plastic vinyl gig bag that I took to school one day because we were going to rehearse in the drummer's basement. And I caught holy hell from the principal for bringing that to school. It fit in my locker, but I got hell. But I was walking home and six blocks north of my house, Terry, was a real old school Catholic orphanage, not foster homes. I mean, Blues Brothers oh, yeah. orphanage. And I was walking by, and it had a schoolyard fenced around it. A lot of kids went there. Everybody knew about St. Thomas Orphanage. And one of the nuns was out, and she was throwing a football to the kids. Nun habit, the whole thing. And she came over and said, hey, what do you got there? And I said, it's a guitar. She said, oh, well, that's good. And she was very friendly. You know, she looked like she was probably in her mid-40s. Oh, that's kind of good. And, and I said, yeah, we're in a band. band. I'm going to go to practice. Oh, yeah. So she said, hey, you should talk to Sister Veronica. I remember that, Sister Veronica, like the Elvis Costello. And I did. I went to this, the Mother Superior, and said, can our band play in your little cafeteria room? And she said, let me think about it. She must have been 100 years old, you know. And she, she said, and very sweet. And she said, let me think about that. So I gave her my number. By the time I got home, I only lived six blocks away. She called, she said, and my mom goes, it's Sister Veronica from the orphanage, you know. I, I picked it up. She said, hey, I think that'd be good. You know, does your band do like rock music? I said, yeah, but we're not that loud and the songs are good, you know. So we played there. That was my first game. Was it a, was a Catholic orphanage? And I remember the kids just being in, just enraptured by a shitty little three-piece band playing Hang On Sloopy. And the look on their face was like, I'm doing this forever. You know, they just got such a kick out of it. Oh, yeah. You know, we all plugged into the same silver tone amp, microphone, bass, guitar, you know, like everybody did, you know. And it was magical, just absolutely magical. And I knew I couldn't go back to like, should I be a bad jock or should I try to be smart, you know? <laughs> you know, and then there was a bar, an airbase bar that the black guys on the base went to. It was an off right off right outside the airbase that they went there on the jukebox played only Memphis soul music, Chicago soul music. And Somebody said, they'll let any band play there on Sunday afternoon. Wow. And we were only 14. 
And so I called them, yeah, you know, so I tried to sound older. <laughs> this is like, I wasn't a good player at that time, but as far as curiosity and balls, nobody could touch me. <laughs> nobody, I was, I was there. And I said, could our band play on Sunday? Yeah, go ahead. You only get, uh, we pay you in uh, Coke or orange juice. I said, that's fine. So I remember we went to this place and it was only a sea of like guys from the air base, black guys from the air base, at Mo from Malmstrom Air Base. And we did it about two or three times and lied to our parents that we were playing at the CYO, the Catholic Youth Organization. <laughs> Until one of the moms found out and said, they're playing at that club. We were only 14. Our drummer was 13 years old. You know? But I couldn't turn back after that, Terry. You know, you know, now I hope I haven't talked my, your ear off. Oh, you no. Know, you'll have a lot to edit, that's for sure. <laughs> what other well, questions do you have? Well, I had, I just had one more. It was sure. about the uh, Bottles and Trees album and working with Jody Hanks. And, and I, I, it, now, was that a, a new thing getting back with him, or had you been working with him some over the years? A little bit. We did. I he did a solo record that I produced for him and wrote in the late two thousands, and then we said we're going to do another one. Now that I'm getting this recording thing better, learning how to produce better, then dig this. This is another great story of health and maladies, as you and I both can experience. He's doing a gig in Florida in two thousand nineteen. He's flying back and his ears don't unpop. Next day, they don't unpop. And they never unpop. And he's lost his hearing. He's going to the doctor every two minutes. They're doing procedures. They're doing this. The doctor goes, you got to admit it. You're done. Your days are over. Then he still goes, you know, you can still sing. You know, singers plug their ear. Oh, yeah. I still have my hearing, but the hearing has messed up his voice. He loses his voice. For a lead singer who can't hear and can't sing, that's pretty yeah. detrimental. So he's done in his mind. He's depressed. He's suicidal. He's just gone. The hearing is bad. And so he gets these kind of contact lenses for his ears. And sure enough, it gets a little bit better, a little bit better. And I always vowed, I said, Jody, one day we're going to do a record better than the two that we made in the 80s that we're both on. One was on a minor label. The other one was on a major label. And we hated both of them. We're going to do a record we're really proud of. So about last, by the time the, the quarantine kicked in, he was starting to feel a bit better. So I said, I'm going to write and prepare some tracks. I'll send them to Dick Shopto. And if you feel up to it, go in and cut a vocal track. And he's like kind of scared, you know. So he went in and he did one. Boom. He did great. Just from muscle memory and excitement. And he's good to, so good to start with. So I said, well, don't push it. So all that record and then all of a sudden it was just a writing binge song after song after song after song and he would send a poem you know poems that's how he writes he writes in like a like a poem he like frank cox and ann wilson they write in like a song format you know jody writes in like a poem and you insert here and it's kind of fun to play with a rubik's cube of these parts and his voice kind of came back and so lo and behold, I said, we have more songs than we need. And so the, the bottle trees, I said, let's, let's go south of Memphis into that spooky part of the Delta, not traditional Delta blues, but the music that's influenced by that. Clarksdale, you know, the crossroads. Yeah. And that, that subject has sort of been done to death a little bit. And there's lots of bad delta blues guys like that i said we, we can't compete with the purists of that so let's do songs that were influenced from that so the cd cover the the bottles and trees is from that folkloric myth 
of down there, they're the very superstitious people in the Delta, you know, that these bad juju demons are flying everywhere and the wind, they put the bottles in the trees. So when the wind whistles to them, it fools these bad mojo demons that go inside the bottles and they get trapped there. And they can't get out. So they can't cause any mischief to, to anybody. And so I said, that's a good, good image. In fact, the picture was taken at a hotel outside a hotel called the, the uh, Shack Up Inn. That's not that far from the original crossroads, Robert Johnson crossroads, you know. And I spent man, about a month down in that area driving around. I was looking for songs on a record I made called Hey Rainmaker, where I wanted to find some old, not, not tried and true blues songs, but what came before that, which was black gospel, how that got turned into blues. So I wanted to find some songs. And I stayed at a hotel, I stayed there, and I also stayed at the Riverside Inn, which is that hotel, which was a Jim Crow hotel in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s that only black folks, artists could stay at. Fascinating story. If you go to Riverside Inn on YouTube, you'll see Mr. Radcliffe will tell the story of this. So I stayed in room five, this hotel the whole time, and it was Muddy Waters' room that he stayed, but Sam wow. Cooke lived there, Holland Wolf, Albert King, B.B. King, because there was no hotel they could stay. Then they just get on the train station that would take them up to Memphis, down to St. Louis, down to Vicksburg, Jackson, what have you, but that's the bottle tree. So there's songs sort of, you know, influenced in that area. And that, that, so that record's done really well too. We went through two shipments of that. Wow. And we're working on a new record that is um, that is even better, I think. A little bit, a little bit more rocky riffs to it, riff based, you know, where you start out with one of those Jim McCarty from Cactus kind of riffs. Yeah. There's a song around that. Who's great, by the way, you know. He'd be a good guy to have on your show too. Oh yeah. He's still, still moving, you know? Yeah, I saw him play a couple of times when I lived in Michigan. He was he's young. scary good. Oh, yeah. You know, he just brings his fingers and a Les Paul and a Twin Reverb, and he's done. Yeah, you know? when I was in high school, he was in the Rockets, and that was they the were Rockets. big. Now, was the drummer for the Rockets? Uh, Johnny was B. One of the guys in Mitch Ryder in the Detroit yep. Mets, too. Mm -hmm. Johnny Belichick. Yep. yep. So, and you know, that band was the Detroit Wheels. They were so heads above, you know, the kind of the British invasion or the, the American, you know, American bandstand kind of bands that we had here. They just seemed like they were scarier and more bad yeah. to me, you know. But they were great. He he's a good, so good. And he plays his ass off now, you know. But that new, but the news back to the new CD, that did so much better for considering. There's no record company, really. You got to kind of do it yourself. Yeah. Which which is a good thing because you have more control over it, and you don't find you don't find yourself like when we did our records on major labels. It just seemed like we're the smallest part of this. Yeah. We're just the musicians, you know. Everybody else is controlling the fate of this record except for us, you know, and. By doing it yourself, you really do it. So if it does well by some people's standards, that's great. If it doesn't, then it's your own fault. But we're lucky, I'm pretty good with this and trading files to Dick Shopto, who engineers it all. Mm -hmm. And it's really, in fact, I'm going to send you a track of the new one that will slay you. It is okay. Black Gospel Killing. And if the B3 solo in the middle, doesn't knock you out. You are in a coma, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, did I give you enough material to work with? Oh yeah. Great. Yeah, I want. I want to thank you for this, and we definitely want to have you back. I have to thank the wonderful Terry Mathley, T Bones Prime Cuts, 
on the other side for having me as a guest on the show. He is one of the true two thumbs up keepers of the flame of music. And that is a rare and precious. And I'll end with my favorite Cannonball Adderley compliment that he used to tell people. He would go, and I'll do it. T-Bone, thank you for letting the cashmere of your existence rub up against the burlap of mine. <laughs> Over and out, man. Thank you very much. You got it. Okay. Take care, Terry. Uh, all right, all right, bye. We'd like to thank Danny Mangold for all his time today. And want you to be sure to go to soundcloud.com slash Danny Dash Mangold. And for the new record, go to reverbnation.com slash Jody Hanks Danny Mangold 2020. And don't worry, those are long URLs. I'll have all the links in the show description on all the platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all of them, on my website and on YouTube. And also, please go to tbpcpodcast.com and click that donate button. We'll see you next time.